text is a phenomenal way to counsel people of all ages. I mean, we're mostly getting young people, but all ages. Turns out it's amazing. So every day we spike at lunchtime. Why? Because your kid is sitting there at lunch texting. The other kids at the table think that she's texting someone across the room, and she's actually texting us. Nobody hears her. There's no voice, so you can text us. You're probably sick of hearing the word like or um or repetition or hyperventilating or crying. You don't get any of those things by text. You just get facts. So by the third message, they have spilled their guts to us. We have heard every gruesome thing that has happened to them, and that means that our crisis counselors can help and can get them the information and the referral that they need or get them from that hot moment to that cool moment. It's an incredibly, incredibly effective way to counsel. So every day we do two active rescues, um, almost two active rescues. An active rescue is when someone has the intention to commit harm to themselves, the plan, and the means. So um, an example of this would be a girl who texted in saying, I want to kill myself. And the crisis counselor says, do you, do you know how you would do this? And she says, yes, I have a bottle of pills on the desk in front of me. And the counselor says, how about putting that in the desk drawer while we talk? By the way, talk is the same as text, but talk. In six million messages, not a single person has asked us for a phone number. They prefer to text. Um, while that uh, conversation is going between the texter and the counselor, a supervisor has been alerted, and we're calling 911. If someone texts in to a hotline, it means they want help. So when we say, where are you, most of the time they give us their address. Frankly, when they don't, we can find out where they are anyway, because we can do geolocation. Turns out some of Homeland is real, um, so we can find out where they are. So the supervisor is doing that. Um, at one point, the conversation between this particular texter and the counselor went silent, and it went silent for about 20 minutes. The next text message we got said, this is the mom. We're in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. I, has, I had no idea. I was in the house at the time. Thank you. And about a month later, the next message we got was from that kid saying, I just got out of the hospital. I was diagnosed as bipolar. I'm going to be OK. So it's, it's pretty powerful. And we're saving lives every day. The thing that really gets me excited about Crisis Text Line is the data. And so the data can be used in two ways. One is to make us better, and two is to make the world better. So it makes us better. The day Robin Williams committed suicide, there was a three hour wait time on the National Suicide Hotline. So you're feeling suicidal, you call an 800 number, you get put on hold for three hours. Right? You've all experienced hold buttons calling you know, airlines and things. But imagine being suicidal, wanting help, and you get put on hold. With us, because of the data, we are able, we wrote scripts, AI scripts, and um, alternative uh, scripts. I'm, I'm, um, let me dumb this down a little bit. So uh, we use natural language processes. And basically, we tag words in real time. So that if you text in, I want to die, or I want to hurt myself, it goes code orange and you're bumped up to number one in the queue. So we can rank people based on severity, and we can take you immediately. That makes us better. Another thing that makes us better is the data that we have from running all this AI and NLP, our corpus of data, six million messages later, we have a valuable corpus, right? So we have what's considered a really strong body of data, because it has three things, which is what you need for a great data set, volume, velocity, and variety. Okay, if you have those three things, you have a really great data set. Why is that good? Because we've layered on what's called a bag of words algorithm. And so now we know that if you text in the words MG and rubber band, there's a 99% match for something. Can you guess what that is? It's, yes, substance abuse. And if you text in sleeve and numbs, there's a 99% match for something. Can you guess what that is? Cutting. Here's one. Sex, oral, and Mormon. 99% match for something. Questioning LGBTQ. 
So some of these things, you, you, you could figure them out, right? As a crisis counselor, if you really stopped and thought about it, you would think, okay, this, this makes sense. Like you guessed heroin, you guessed substance abuse, you would have guessed cutting if I gave you more time. Um, what's great is the robot, the natural language processes, the AI, are, the robots are not replacing the counselors. The robots are making the counselors faster and more accurate. So this is the first example, really, of science and data being applied to counseling. The, the way I like to describe this is, in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, but in this room, someone here has seen a shrink or a marriage counselor at some point in time in your life, okay? Yeah, oh, there you go, great. Okay, so how do you know that person's any good? How do you know that it should take five sessions to cure your foot fetish, as opposed to five years? Right? So like, I would think a marriage counselor would be brilliant if she said, Nancy, you're great. Jason, I've got to see you next week. I'd be like, I love her. This is a brilliant marriage counselor. She's great. She's what? Like, she's Jewish and she charges us fairly and she never cancels. Like, the, how else do you know she's close to, she's in the West Village? Like, I don't know. How would you know that a marriage counselor was any good or that a shrink was any good? You, you, you don't. But they have a fancier degree on the wall. It may be from Harvard, but they may have been in the bottom 50% of the class. You don't know. So... We know. We actually know what makes a counselor great. So we know who responds quickly. We know that maybe everybody responds to an LGBTQ issue in two minutes, but it takes you four minutes. So maybe there's some kind of a latent homophobia going on there. We know the words that are more effective in getting someone from a hot to a cool moment on certain issues. We're able to basically say what makes a great counselor and what makes an effective counselor. And that makes us better and faster and cheaper as an organization, which is what science and data and technology for good is supposed to be, faster, better, cheaper. Now that makes us better, but I also said that the data was going to make the world better. So there has not been a comprehensive study on mental health and young people in America since 1997, covering all issues. Places like the CDC do studies on suicide every two years, but not a comprehensive study on all of these issues. And so because of all this NLP and this data set, we now have the first real-time map of crises in America. So I can tell you, for example, that you, while Montana might be a very nice place to visit, you never want to live there. Um, Montana is like in the top five for every horrible thing. Um, I can tell you that the worst day of the week for eating disorders, do you want to guess? Monday. Monday is the worst day for eating disorders, followed by Saturday and Sunday. It's really a Saturday, Sunday, Monday thing and doesn't happen much during the rest of the week. I can tell you that anxiety during the school year spikes at 8 a.m. and during the summer spikes at 11 a.m. I can tell you that every day during the week we see a lot of volume for LGBTQ questions, except Friday. Friday it's like half the volume of other days. So what does this data mean? If I ran a school, I'd be concerned about what was on the lunch menu on Mondays. I would be thinking about the guidance counselors being prepped differently on Mondays. If I ran a gay and lesbian teen line, I would make sure that it was open other days of the week. We once met an organization and told us them and they gulped and said, our teen line is only open on Fridays. We were like, great, that's like the best day to be gay in America, but why don't you pick another day? Um, uh, uh, the, the states that are spiking for certain things, if I worked in government or policy or journalism or academia, I would want to understand what the heck is going on. Turns out in Montana, the reason why, and it's all adjusted per capita, why Montana is so awful is because you might have heard we have a habit in this country of treating Native Americans pretty badly, and there's a lot of suffering and a lot of suicide going on right now in Montana um, on Native American reservations. Um, so all of this data is now available real time. It's under a Creative Commons license, so anybody can pull it and use it. Starting in July, we're going to open up aggregated data sets, um, which means people can pull specialized things and see relationships between things. We want to fuel research. We want to fuel policy. Um, because it's not enough to just save lives one at a time. We want to prevent the bad stuff from happening to begin with. So maybe it makes sense why I'm leaving my job at Do Something to Go Do Crisis Text Line full time. It's the first and the greatest example I've seen so far of data for good. I think it's lovely that Target can figure out like when you're pregnant and send you special targeted ads and you know, I think it's great that we're using technology so that young people can swipe left and swipe right and date, I guess, more effectively and quickly. Um, but to me, the best use of tech and data is to actually make the world a better place. <laughs>